So welcome to this uh, uh, PCR webinar entitled uh, How Should I Treat My TAVI Patients Today uh, and Ensure uh, Future Coronary uh, Access? So my name is Didier Cheche. I'm an interventional cardiologist uh, from uh, Toulouse. And I have the great privilege uh, today to uh, co-moderate this webinar with uh, two friends of mine, Mauricio Taramazzo from uh, Zurich and uh, Hi, hello, Juan everybody. from uh, uh, Leipzig. So hello, guys. Uh, so we have a, a very interesting uh, webinar today, and this uh, is supported by Abbott. And we have uh, a, a couple of uh, learning objectives. And uh, through the discussion that we're going to have with uh, the community, because this remains an interactive webinar, so feel free to pop up your questions and comments, and we will uh, answer them during the, this webinar. So the, one of the first point of discussion, and at the end, we hope that you will be, uh, uh, you will have all the tools to uh, uh, understand and to learn about uh, the importance of easy coronary access for post TAVI. Uh, that you will get all the uh, elements uh, and the techniques to achieve a proper commercial alignment with the portico device uh, in particular. And at the end, to uh, discuss, we will discuss the best uh, timing for coronary uh, revascularization in patients undergoing TAVI and requiring uh, a PCI. So this is uh, quite a a uh, dense uh, uh, part of uh, objectives. So once again, interactivity uh, is key for this type of webinar. So pop up your questions and comment and we will answer them. So uh, the base for discussion will be a recorded case. Uh, so I guess uh, it's time to uh, start the video and we will come back afterwards uh, to start the, the discussion. Welcome to uh, Clinic Pasteur for this uh, uh, recorded case of a transfemoral uh, TAVI with the portico device. So my name is Didier Cheche, Nicolas Dumontel, so uh, my friend and partner, highly experienced with the, uh, the device, and Sabine, who is going to help us, the nurse who is going to help us today for the procedure, and Marlene is going to be the circulating uh, nurse. So, uh, Nico, without further ado, uh, should we start with the case presentation? Yes, thanks, Didier. So the patient we're going to treat today is an 88 years old female, having of course severe aortic stenosis, not overweighted as you see, um, suffering from hypertension and non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And she experienced recently a pulmonary edema that revealed the progression of uh, this uh, aortic stenosis to a severe uh, uh, status. And despite optimization by medical therapy, she's still symptomatic in shortness of breath class 2 and effort angina. Uh, on the baseline ECG, she's on sinus rhythm with a right bundle branch block. On laboratory investigation, nothing remarkable. Transthoracic echo showed a normal uh, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction. Of course, severe aortic stenosis, 0.9 centimeters square mean gradient, 54, and no pulmonary hypertension at rest. On the baseline angiography, and probably uh, uh, partly uh, participating to the angina, is a severe stenosis uh, of a mid LAD at a bifurcation uh, location with a big diagonal branch, a Medina 010 uh, um, bifurcation lesion. On the CT scan, we see at the annulus level a perimeter derived diameter at 20.4 almost comparable at the LVOT level, 21 millimeters, or tubular configuration. The ASOV is a generous 32, uh, takeoff of left main and right coronary artery, also comfortable in this sinusal valsalva, so uh, no issues regarding coronary perfusion in case of TAVI. The projections we could use uh, in the cusp overlap view uh, is an Aero 11 Codal 20. And you see on the right uh, an overall view of the uh, uh, artery as uh, iliofemoral arteries and aorta, but are really, really favorable for TAVI transfemoral. So these are the risk scores. And uh, it, uh, this patient, of course, was assessed by our heart team. And considering all the factors that you, you saw, um, was offered a, a transfemoral TAVI uh, solution. Next slide. So our strategy today that you will see on the next slide is a, a routine streamlined transfemoral TAVI under conscious sedation, all the setting conventional that you detail DDA. 
will predilate with a 20 millimeter balloon, intend to implant a portico uh, valve with a commercial alignment uh, technique in order to preserve uh, coronary access uh, and perfusion. And based on the severity of the uh, coronary lesion and its uh, uh, symptoms uh, uh, as angina that this patient is experiencing, will perform a, a, a PCI on this uh, LED lesion. Perfect. Thank you, Nico. Uh, so the valve is going to be a Portico 25. Uh, so uh, we've seen the, uh, the case presentation and all the challenges of this patient. We have a, a elderly uh, patient that is uh, symptomatic with uh, uh, dyspnea and angina, combining an aortic stenosis with a coronary disease and a right bundle branch block at baseline. So uh, Mauricio, uh, what would be your strategy You've seen the strategy that we proposed, Nicolas and myself, but how would you tackle such a patient if it was your patient? I think, as you said, there are several challenges in this patient, no doubt regarding the indication, obviously. I think that uh, having a patient with concomitant coronary artery disease is becoming more and more frequent, and we have to deal with this problematic. I totally agree with the use of self-expandable valve in this case, uh, especially due to the fact that uh, there is a really small annulus, so having a self-expandable valve with a good hemodynamic, being also intraannular to allow easier access to the coronary, I think is a good choice. The annulus is not highly calcific, despite the leaflet they are. So I think the decision that you, you took would be the same in our center as well. And obviously having a high risk for pacemaker, like in this case, because the patient has a right bundle branch block already before, uh, put the, the challenges of uh, proper implantation because there are some advantages of using self-expandable, but you may end up with maybe a slightly high risk of, of pacemaker implantation. So the fact that you will use uh, overlapping cusp U2 implant and you will show us how to do it will probably reduce, if not abolish, abolish not, and maybe I'm too optimistic, but for sure will reduce a lot the, the chance of having pacemaker implantation. So we should not regret in implanting a self-expandable device, even if in high-risk patient. So we clearly understand the, um, the advantages of a self-expanding platform, and in, uh, the Portico in particular, for both the hemodynamics in such, such, such a small anatomy, and second, the potential for coronary uh, uh, treatment. And we will see if this has an impact also on the last challenge, that is the, the higher uh, likelihood of uh, AV conduction disturbances at the end of the procedure. But uh, Mohamed, if we uh, focus on the coronary disease of this patient, uh, are there some uh, specific subgroup of patients that you would uh, systematically treat uh, at the time, whether it be at the time of the procedure before or after, but for whom you would tackle uh, the, the coronary disease? systematically yeah I think this is a this is a very important question but I'm I'm, I'm sorry to to say that I don't have a, a, a very scientific answer to it because um, unfortunately the data we have do not help us so it's more or less um, observation the registry data that we have to look at the only randomized trial that was performed the activation trial was not able to enroll a lot of patients but um, currently, we have to base our decision based on um, clinical sense and what we're comfortable of doing in our everyday clinical practice. So um, for me, I'm like a little bit old school still, so I, I'd like to revascularize patients before TAVI, particularly if they have proximal disease. But on the other hand, there are patients, and maybe this patient is one of them. She's very old. She has... A, clearly a predominant aortic valve disease, even if the PCI appears to be easygoing, but some things could happen even if in a straightforward, apparently straightforward PCI. So probably in, in, in some cases, you wanna have the aortic stenosis fixed first and then have the opportunity to do PCI maybe in a more stable setting. Um, so it's the, the decision is more or less, in my opinion, based on a lot of clinical uh, circumstances. And if we uh, uh, push a little bit the discussion, because I like this type of discussion, because this is a daily discussion. This is what we uh, have to uh, decide for every uh, single patient of this type. 
we have that coronary uh, lesion. Uh, do you think that the um, the simultaneous uh, observation of an aortic stenosis and a coronary artery disease has an impact on the valve choice? That is to say, do you think that uh, long pacing runs may have an impact on that on your final uh, decision on the type of device, or is it something that you do regardless of the uh, the coronary disease? You use whatever device for this type of patients. Yeah, I mean, probably like I mean, very extensive disease, particularly in patients with also reduced LV function. In this, is, in, the, in these circumstances, maybe device choice and the amount of pacing would make a difference, particularly if you don't revascularize patients beforehand. But in other situations, uh, I don't think it makes a big difference. So we, we thought that pacing could increase ischemia, but we don't see this actually if the disease is focal, not very extensive, if LV function is, is okay. But I would consider device choice to be more important when it comes to uh, coronary access afterwards. I think this is what, what, what we have to consider in our heart team meetings and considering device choice. And there are actually a lot of questions from the, uh, from the audience in this context, a lot of suggestions uh, about the type of device you could be using here. So there's one question, for example, asking you, um, considering the right bundle branch block, the risk of pacemaker implantation, the presence of coronary disease, why don't you think of a balloon expandable platform, for example, or for example, uh, an accurate neo valve is suggested here because of the lower pacemaker rate. Could you maybe, did you want to comment on this? So the, yeah. the different device types and their effect on pacing and coronary access? So definitely, and that's uh, one of the reasons why we uh, decided to choose that case for discussion because it's definitely uh, raising a lot of concern because we have various devices that are available and we need for each device to make sure that we're going to get the best outcome for the for the patient. And for these patients, they were, the, the challenges have been identified. Uh, but we had the feeling that with a self-expanding platform, first we could achieve proper hemodynamics in this small anatomy, as uh, you said, Maurizio, beforehand. Uh, second, that we could uh, treat coronary the coronary artery disease, whether it be before or after, it doesn't matter, that the open cell design will help us. Uh, so this is this matches with your your comment, uh, Mohammed. And um, at the at the end, uh, if we achieve a very high implant, in our experience, even with self-expanding platform, we may achieve single digit pacemaker rate. So all the objectives uh, could be fulfilled, uh, given uh, keeping in mind that we need to achieve the proper uh, device size selection, the proper technique during the procedure, and we're going to see that during the, the case. So this was a very, very uh, first and uh, in a dense discussion, but very important part strategy-wise. Uh, let's see uh, what we, uh, we did uh, during the, the case. So let's resume the video. So Nico, we have that uh, projection that was uh, proposed by the CT scan. Uh -huh. And I, I, I think it's we have live confirmation that the predicted uh, cusp of lab view is uh, quite good, and the one we'll use um, to uh, improve and and make the positioning more accurate regarding the issue of a potential AV block, and it's why uh, it's uh, the, the most useful and to use this cusp of lab view, and we'll detail while implanting the valve how to interpret this uh, projection also regarding the commissural alignment technique. So, Mohamed, you have a, a lot of experience. We've seen that cusp of lab view. You have a lot of experience with various type of devices. And so, uh, how would you uh, summarize for, for us and for the audience, uh, predominantly, mainly, uh, the key principles of a cusp of lab uh, technique? Yes. Yeah, so, if we can show this on a few slides. Um, so, uh, let's bring up the first slide here. So. What we are all probably aware of and comfortable with is this um, S-shaped curve of the aortic annular plane on fluoroscopy. And we are all familiar with the coplan or three cusp view, which is on this curve um, exactly here in the middle, this green uh, dot, which is the um, plane where you can see all three cusps um, separated with the right coronary cusp in the middle. This is the co-planner view or the three cusp view where we are used to or we were used to to implant several types of devices. 
while you, and of course, while you are going or while you are walking through this S-shaped curve, you can play a little bit with these cusps and you can overlap um, 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 a couple of them as you go through this S-shaped line. And this is what we call the cusp overlap view. For example, if you isolate the non-coronary cusp on one side and you overlap the right and the left, then you have, um, usually uh, this is an REO coder view, and you have here what we call the RL cusp overlap view. If you go um, a little bit towards the iliocranial view, you can at some point of time isolate the left, left cusp and you can overlap the non and the right. So this is another sort of cusp overlap view, but with other cusps overlapping and, other, and, and the left cusp isolated, and so on and so forth. So this is important to know that the cusp overlap view is not only one, so there are several, so there are three cusp overlap views. And uh, when we are currently talking about the cusp overlap view, usually we mean this ario coder view where we isolate the non-coronary cusp. Why is this important? Uh, it has two reasons or two um, uh, like explanations. One of them is, and we learned this from the work of Nico Piazza, that this um, the three cusp view is usually, if you compare it to an echocardiographic view, it's similar to a two chamber view where the LVOT is foreshortened. Uh, if you compare this to the cusp overlap view, the RL cusp overlap view, this is comparable to a three chamber view in echocardiography where you have the LVOT elongated. This means that you probably can assess your implantation depth a little bit more accurately in a cusp overlap view compared to a three chamber view. So this would be one uh, advantage. The second advantage uh, would be that when you have the one cusp isolated, in this case the non-coronary cusp, and you overlap the two other cusps, then automatically you isolate one commissure, which is in this case the commissure between the left and the right cusp on one side, and you have two overlapping commissures on the other side. This could be helpful if you want to obtain commissure alignment, because you simply isolate one and you have two on the other side, so it's, it makes your um, appreciation of the anatomy a little bit easier and with specific types of devices like with the portico device we're going to see but with other devices as well we have some markers on the catheters and we can a little bit um, orient ourselves and try to achieve commercial alignment so this is what what is meant by the cost overlap view in a brief uh, overview and the two potential advantages so thank you that was uh, really uh, clear uh, but some might uh, might say, okay, I'm used to, to work in the uh, in the free cusp view, and I'm achieving extremely good uh, outcomes for my patients with that. Uh, so, Maurizio, if you had a couple of uh, a simple or a couple of simple messages just to uh, promote that cusp overlap technique, what would it be? What, what are the the key advantages for you? I think one is the one that Mohamed already pointed out. Having the elongated LVOT, we can really assess. Obviously, if you are highly experienced and you are working since many years with different projections, you probably may not need it. But since we need to standardize, I think this is the best standardized way. And there are already some initial data with other platforms showing that you can implant higher with lower pacemaker rate and even with, with lower PV leak rate. And the um, second one, personally, I really don't like to use the three-cusp view for self-expandable in general because often you have a lot of parallax and you have to adjust the projection. If you implant in the areo codal overlapping cusping view, usually you don't have any parallax, so you have a good alignment also with the device, and this allows you to be, to be really precise. But I think the key is the reproducibility. Okay. So very, uh, very clear. So... Uh... Uh, it's, so that's the, the technique that we uh, decided to use for the, this patient for all that you, uh, the reasons that you've mentioned. And for sure, one of the objectives was, was to make sure that we had a high implant to mitigate the risk of uh, uh, AV block conduction disturbances uh, at the end of the procedure. So that was, for us, extremely important, as it is in, more, in a more contemporary practice, to use the cusp overlap technique for this self-expanding platform. Okay. Uh, so uh, thank you uh, for this uh, nice, uh, nice overview. Let's resume the video and see what are the, the next steps of the outcome for the patient. On hemodynamic, you see, we keep in mind for the, the final uh, hemodynamic assessment, the level of LVMD diastolic pressure that is 20, 
diastolic, arctic diastolic that is um, around 40 um, and heart rate at uh, 62 or uh, 65. So know, yeah, let's keep that very, in mind. Uh, very yeah. high gradient. It's, yeah, yeah, of uh, course. Yeah, more than 60. What is really uh, in interesting, Nico, is once again the location of the Levenshko wire yeah. that is not pointing towards the uh, uh, non-coronary uh, cusp between the non and the and the, the right, and that tells us that for a need of pre-dilatation because yeah. we have some bias. So we're going to pace at 180. Okay, pacing on. Okay, you can inflate, Nico. Balloon up. Balloon up, injection, and deflation, Balloon down. and pacing off. Okay, so let's just uh, withdraw the balloon and then we will uh, review what we have, Nico. Yeah. We immediately see that we uh, we don't have a third degree heavy block. And yeah. sometimes we, with such baseline RBB, it happens uh, just after the, the, the balloon valvuloplasty. So it's not here the case. So that's sure. a, that's a very important comment. Yeah. Yeah, pressure recovery is good. So we always in in such situation perform the BAV um, uh, having the valve already uh, prepared and yep. to be implanted in case of uh, hemodynamic crush. So okay. let's review the the BAV. Yeah. So what we see is first uh, quite stable position of the balloon. We don't have any major filling of the LV, so the no. 20 millimeter really matches the uh, the mean perimeter derived diameter of the annulus. So we should be okay with a 25. And quite importantly, we knew that we know that the uh, left coronary uh, takeoff is quite high, but here there is no obstruction deep, despite the calcium load at the level of the leaflets that we can clearly see here. Uh, for the right, we don't clearly see it because there is a bias of the balloon towards the right part of the anatomy yeah. that explains that um, that aspect. Okay, so let's go for valve okay. implantation. Okay, Nico. So the uh, the capsule uh, of the catheter is uh, within the uh, right common femoral artery. We can see the uh, inter integrated sheath. So do you want to drive us towards the uh, the way you rotate the the handle to be sure that we have a proper commissural? Yes. Alignment? Yeah. So we'll see inside the patient. You have also some uh, landmarks in the frame to to follow in order to achieve this commissural alignment. But the way the valve is uh, is uh, crimped into the catheter uh, allows you to um, predict uh, this possible commissural alignment by or orientating the, the delivery capture in a, in a certain way. So you see this side flush port that is here and you just have to orient it towards six o'clock. So like that, you turn clockwise, quarter turn. It's now facing down to six o'clock and that way we, we have a high likelihood to have a good commissural alignment. Okay, very clear. So let's uh, advance and see how this uh, catheter performs within the anatomy. I don't, the FlexNav is really a, a, a superb uh, delivery system that is uh, highly flexible and yeah. definitely to track through the tortuous vessels, it's not an issue. So we may come back to our uh, working projection. It was RAO 10, codal 20. So for once, it's not a too extreme uh, projection. And what we can see already is that the commercial alignment is uh, almost uh, is is really nice. Yeah, I'm going to record without contrast. And uh, now you can see that one of the posts that that uh, that is pointing towards the utmost anterior uh, aspect of the anatomy towards the right part of the screen is seen perpendicularly like a straight line whereas the other ones are a little bit thicker yeah. so we could rotate a little bit more but already that commercial al alignment is yeah. uh, is nice for for this so patient maybe to re-emphasize on that didier huh? because it, it's not um, something maybe uh, our colleagues are used to looking at you, what you have to to look at now is not the the bottom of a prosthesis as we usually do for uh, positioning but just the mid part of a frame that is inside the capture where you see three posts yeah you have them currently under your eyes and if you write when you work in a cusp overlap view as we are if you look at the right part of a, of a frame you see that we see a post in profile so we see a line yeah, instead line, yeah. instead of, or seeing this uh, en face 
So this is the, the confirmation that we have a good commercial alignment in, in, uh, with this uh, device for this patient. Okay, I guess um, so. You, uh, we've seen how, how much we pay attention to the, the position of the, the post to see uh, to achieve a proper commercial alignment. Uh, there are several features of the, the catheter that we need to uh, to discuss. The flex nub, the, the with the features that may be useful in some uh, uh, subgroup of patients. But let's start with the uh, commercial uh, alignment. It seems to be more and more key because we are dealing with sometimes younger patients so we need to make sure that we uh, keep the access to the coronary arteries open as an option so maurizio how would you uh, uh, summarize this, the the steps for a proper commissural alignment with the portico device yeah i think this is becoming really mandatory uh, we have some slide to to summarize how we arrive to this concept obviously what uh, what we need to have is to have in the, the projection, in the working projection, two of the commissure aligned on one side and one on the other side. Obviously, there are different projections to do it. One is the areo codal, which is the uh, overlapping cast technique. Actually, before coming to how to do it, we try to validate this concept in a bench model, and we did this by isolating the left cusp on one side because we thought that having the uh, aortic arch open, so working in LAO cranial was easier in order to, to allow us to, to align the commissure already in the descending aorta, because obviously it's already it's easier to align in the descending aorta rather than align when you are after the crossing of the arch, because you have some torque on the system. But the concept is exactly the same. You can see in this bench model that we were able to to align the commissural spot to the native commissure in virtually all the cases. And actually, we came out exactly with the recommendation that you and Nicola showed, uh, which is that uh, you have to turn basically 90 degrees uh, clockwise the device in order to achieve commissural alignment in most of the cases. And again, this we did several tests, and we were able with different configuration to obtain uh, commissural alignment in all cases. And this is just a summary on uh, what we did. Actually, you align two commissure on, on one side. The marker that you see here are the commissural one, are not the marker at the nadir of the cast. We see we are aligning two commissure on the inner curvature because at the beginning we, we wanted to work in, uh, in, in LAO in order to have the arch open and in order to be able to align two marker in the inner curvature and one in the outer curvature, because we thought this would have been easier to validate the method. And this is actually what we did, exactly like in the model. You showed really well that the three commissural spots can be isolated, and it's really easy to align them in the descending aorta. If you work in this kind of overlapping cast view, which is a different one to the one that Mohamed showed before, you can easily align two commissural marker in the inner curvature, which will correspond to the two commissural marcher on the right in the ascending aorta and one on the right. And you see, look at my hand in the right part of the screen. At the end, what we did and what we want to recommend to the user is that you have to turn the device with the flashing port pointing at six o'clock. So you turn 90 degrees clockwise the device. This was done to validate. Obviously, uh, before releasing, you can check, you can correct. You can turn about, I think, 30 degrees in the ascending aorta. You cannot turn much more, even if with flex nav, having a really flexible system is probably easier to correct even in the ascending aorta. And then if you have two spots on one side and the other one on the opposite, you can decide to release or you can decide to recapture and correct the orientation. And uh, this is just one example. Obviously, this needs to be tested in larger scale. But at the end, uh, having the possibility to predict the projection where, where you have two commissure aligned on, on one side and, and one on the other side, and having the possibility to, to visualize really well in the valve, even when it is crimped, where the commissure are, makes this really easy and reproducible. But to make everything simple at the end, you have to turn the device 90 degrees count, uh, clockwise, and then you may check the orientation before deploying just to check that 
it's working in this patient. But I think for the user, what we need to tell is to give a recommendation on how to insert the device in the patient, if you agree. So we start, so it was clear, uh, clear uh, crystal clear. So we start uh, with a rotation of the handle at 90 degrees. But let's imagine that we, uh, we, we don't achieve a proper commercial alignment at the start. Uh, Mohamed, we've seen that the FlexNav is quite flexible. It's a truly uh, suited device for tortuous vessels, and given the profile, it tracks everywhere. But where, at which location would you rotate uh, the catheter just to achieve a proper commercial alignment? Would you do it across the valve, or would you do it, as uh, Mauricio has uh, proposed, into the, uh, the aorta? Mold, uh, it's a good system. question. I, I think this is something really that is still ongoing, like the development of what to do best. Um, and I think we, we started to learn first thing that there are certain anatomies where you probably would probably need more adjustment. So as you both said, if you go on at six o'clock with a flush port, maybe you got it right the, the, the first time in the majority of patients. But if you, for example, if you use maybe the contralateral axis, the left side, as opposed to the right side, or if you have a very tortuous aorta, then probably even if you start like that, you would need to adjust. And then the question would be, how much do I need to adjust? As Maurizio said, if it's just, if you think you are almost right, you just need to adjust a few degrees, then probably you can do this in the ascending aorta. Um, I personally think if, if this is more than a few degrees, then probably going back to the descending aorta could be also maybe a little bit safer, just to avoid manipulation inside the, uh, the disease drive. This would be what, what, what I would do. So very clear message, once again, I like it for, from you above, guys. Very clear messages to pick up. Uh, so uh, let's now move to the, to the case and, uh, and see the next, uh, next steps of the procedure, please. Okay, nice. So let's insert. We may have to correct a little bit, a couple of degrees, uh, the uh, caudal projection, I guess, just to, be, to uh, remove some parallax for the stand frame. Okay. And we're going to start uh, quite high for this patient, particularly. Let's do an injection here. OK, perfect. So it's quite unusual that we start exactly in the middle of the anatomy, but it may be useful here in this particular patient. So you're going to start, uh, Nico, yeah. and then we will uh, fast pace at one point. And we pay a close look to the uh, ECG. So. So far, it's stable. So I like the way you go very yeah. slowly. OK, so let's record first here. And the okay. goal is really to aim uh, high. So we yeah. may start to uh, fast pace, 120, 120. OK, I think you can open up a little bit more, Nico. It's really stable. And that's uh, something that I really like from that uh, cafeteria. Yeah. And capture and uh, the the valve also if it's intra annular position of a leaflet that makes the valve uh, functions as soon as uh, as it flares and then it uh, it participates to the stability. Huh? Yeah. So we can uh, we throw the pacing just to see uh, where we what we have. There was that right bundle branch block, so we have to see if there is something. There, there is no conduction disturbance at all. You can yeah. see that we, there is still the right bundle branch block. So that position is, uh, is nice for the patient. Yeah. Now let's see if it matches the expectations in terms of regurgitation. And of course. We still have some parallax, Nico. Yeah, you, wanna, it, uh, you want yeah? me to correct Maybe that? We can, we can remove that and just analyze the, uh, the uh, position. Like that. OK, let, let's uh, inject, Sabine. Okay, so that's the, that's the position that we, uh, we get. Uh, so um, uh, before seeing what is the outcome for, for this patient, there is a, uh, quite briefly, we need to have that discussion about uh, when do we have to reposition and how do we do it? How do we decide? Do we, first uh, point, do we stay in the aureo caudal, the cusp of a lab view, or do we combine a cusp of a lab view and a more uh, regular, more standard LAO view? And in these views, how do you decide on the, uh, the need for repositioning or not? Uh, let's start with you, uh, Mohamed, to see what, is, uh, what you do in your experience. Yeah, I personally like to move between views as, uh, exactly as you did. Uh, for the cusp overlap view, I think we can judge uh, quite nicely on the uh, depth on the non-coronary side. 
But on the left side, it may be a little bit tricky. Actually, you cannot probably judge on it. And this is why I go to the LEO view again, just to judge on the left side. And also what's important is when you're starting releasing your catheter, in the cusp overlap view, it's a little bit more difficult, as Maurizio said, because the aorta is not unfolded. So you cannot judge exactly on the position of your catheter, whether you need a little bit push or pull during final release. And this is something we, we, we like to do in the LAO view. So we, exactly as you did, we like to move a little bit between views. And the beauty is that the patient is stable. You have an intraanular functioning valve. Um, so you, you can take your time and, and just uh, um, assess whether you, you want to reposition or not. And do you do it the same, Maurizio, or do you have uh, over recommendation? Absolutely. Absolutely, we do the same. We use a combination. We start in areocodal when we use this technique, and then after getting the contact on the other, let's say on the left sinus, we switch to LAO, eliminating the parallax in LAO in order to check the, the high also in, the, in LAO and, and, and to check whether we are in the inner or in the outer curvature or whether we are, in, let's say, in the middle without any tension. Um, so we do exactly the same. It's, uh, it's very important, as you both say, both of you said, to uh, combine both views and to assess the depth uh, from the uh, NCC side and the LCC side in those uh, those views. And uh, it's more about the depth rather than for the, the regurgitation. And what we do, if we think that the patient has a need for uh, post dilatation potentially, and we are really high, we may uh, reshift the device recapture and go one or two millimeters deeper uh, just to get us another margin of safety, I would say. Okay, so very clear messages. So uh, once again, so let's uh, let's move to the to the case. So I like it. Huh? I like yeah. it. Uh, the depth is not too important. Um, almost tri trivial of a mild leak at the moment, but yeah. the valve is not fully deployed, mm -hmm. so it's not the the, the final the, the state status of the, the frame. So it's uh, yeah, position uh, looks yeah. good. So okay. Oh, so let's uh, we may stay in uh, in that projection i'm just going to remove the the pigtail okay i'm pulling a little bit on the stiff wire yeah. centering the nose cone and we're going to fast pace marlene at 120 once again yeah and sorry we have just yeah, to reconnect yeah. just reconnect okay good and you can reopen i'm just going to control the outflow portion just to avoid a sudden jump but this is really exceptional with that uh, catheter that is really stable i have to say okay, okay good. we can stop the pacing thank you marlene so we still have maybe one eyelet but it's yeah. a little bit in contact with the catheter so, so i will let you uh, just play with the wire maybe in echo yeah. push and, pull yeah and you see okay definitely so that was a nice uh, movement is it okay for you do you want yeah. me to to, to withdraw the catheter yeah, yeah thank you nico so let's reinsert the 16 French shift, do the hemodynamics, and then assess the uh, the engine. So Didier, here uh, are the hemodynamic curves uh, post uh, implant. So of course no gradient. Uh, LV and diastolic pressure is stable. Uh, Arctic diastolic is at uh, 40. So it might be related to a leak, but we see sometimes in such patients also a very uh, important arterial stiffness that explains for this uh, huge uh, pulse arterial pressure. So let's yeah. control with angio and uh, we'll have uh, the solution. And the heart rate is very, uh, very it's, stable. Yeah, it's yeah. the same. I know so if you block. Um, okay. So let me just withdraw uh, the pigtail. So it's... Uh, and then we came back to our... Uh, uh, let's first record, uh, as we are in the cusp of a lab view, first the NGO without contrast. Yeah. Okay. And just to uh, once again illustrate what you were saying, Nico. Exactly. We see, we see if you n now look at the, the right part of the Arctic roots, just above uh, calcification that is around uh, the sinotubular junction, left sinotubular junction, you see the post seen in profile. It appears at a small radio, uh, highly radio opaque line. And on the same level on the left, you see the post, the two of the posts seen en face. So this view is the one you want to achieve uh, when you have a good commissural alignment with this uh, portico device in cusp overlap view, confirming that uh, it was obtained. 
So perfect. So let's do the final uh, angiogram before we move to the coronary uh, treatment because there is still that LED lesion that re requires a treatment. Thank you, Sabine. So the depth is really nice. Yeah, depth is nice. Uh, my leak, so it's totally good. And um, yeah, and the deployment of the valve is, uh, yeah. is harmonious. It's fine. We see good indirect coronary perfusion. So let's proceed to the PCI. Uh, yeah, to a PCI. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, if we summarize, we are uh, Nicolas and myself are at that at that step that stage happy first with the position, uh, second with the uh, the patency of the coronary arteries. Uh, so it, it brings us back to the commercial alignment, and we had all the elements from Maurizio and so on to, uh, to achieve a proper commercial alignment. It seems to be the case for this patient. And we have uh, virtual uh, regurgitation and mild regurgitation. So uh, the first, uh, now we need to move to the coronary uh, treatment because that was part of our strategy. So the, one of the first questions that I have for you uh, guys is to share with us, to share with the audience uh, your main tips and tricks just to cannulate the coronary arteries through a stent frame, through a TAVI prosthesis. How do you do? How do you proceed? Because this is something that we need to learn uh, to uh, for TAVI operators and non-TAVI operators to be able to cannulate these arteries because we will need that in the future. So let's start with you, Mauricio. What's uh, If you have some couple, uh, couple of tips and tricks to share, what will... What would that be? Well, I would probably, I have to disclose, I, I am a, a surgeon. I, I do structural intervention, but if there we is more an intervention to do, I call Mohamed or you <laughs> to help me. So obviously, so first what message, I can call a friend. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> but obviously, everything starts from, from the index procedure. So do commissural alignment, implant the valve at the proper high, and then choose the proper valve for the proper patient, I think is the best, uh, uh, I mean, is the best starting point. Then obviously there are some technical tick and trip that are uh, used to cannulate the ostia, but uh, I will let definitely Mohamed and you discuss this, this technical trick for coronary cannulation. So Mohamed, uh, what would you uh, do? You yes. Uh, so, to, so overall, I think it's important that we teach this, as you said, because probably uh, the, the operators who are familiar with the with structure intervention with TAVI prosthesis, they they know how these prosthesis are uh, structured, but uh, others do not. And uh, at the end of the day, the patient will not choose, especially if he has an acute coronary syndrome. He will not choose the hospital he will be referred to. So, so we need to teach this, I think, to them. It, it, it's part of the curriculum, I guess, for interventional curriculum. It should be part of the curriculum. So um, a few tips and tricks. The first thing for me is access. So I think right radial is not my preferred access, if you have, particularly if you have a long self-expanding device, because it may interfere a little bit with catheter manipulation. So left radial or femoral would be what, what I choose first. So I, I wouldn't go for right radial as the, uh, the main axis. Then what I usually also like to do is to like enter the prosthesis with some sort of a pigtail or something, just be sure I'm in the prosthesis. Um, I, if, the patient, if the kidney function allows, I'd like to do a root shot. If I'm not familiar with the anatomy, this gives me an idea about prosthesis height. I mean, in, in your case, you know how you implanted the device, but uh, generally it gives me an idea about height, may give me an idea whether we have commercial alignment or not. Um, and then um, also type to plan the types of catheters. And then I would exchange catheters on a wire, keep the wire on the catheter just to make sure I can manipulate inside this long stent frame. I, and I would definitely downsize the catheters a little bit, particularly for the left side, downsize maybe by 0.5. I, I would like to say that the aorta after such a device is becoming more feminine compared to before the device, so it's, become, it's becoming a little bit smaller. And passive catheters, I like to use passive catheters, so like Judkins types of catheters, even if I'm doing an intervention compared, for example, to extra backup or something, of course you can use, but then you, it's even more important to downsize. 
very clear. Uh, so maybe we could, uh, we can try, we, can, we may try to summarize uh, through one slide what could be the main tips and tricks. So um, this uh, resumes uh, and summarizes what you've said, Mohamed, and I think I like the idea that is not mentioned here, and that's the beauty of this type of discussion because you always uh, pick up some uh, additional tips and tricks that are going to improve your practice. So the first one, as you said, could be uh, to do a root shot just to understand the depth and the commercial alignment, and I like it, and I think it's very important. The second one is to consider to use a pigtail, as you said, just to be um, sure that you uh, enter the, the stand frame in the central position and you are not beside the stand frame, between the outer and the stand frame, and then going back centrally again. And that's really important to make sure that you are uh, within the, the device and that you are central. Uh, for the guiding catheters, as you said, most of the time we downsize, alpha size, and because we are working in a more constrained environment with a sm within a smaller aortic root because we have the borders of the, the TAVI device. And uh, so these are examples of catheters that you may use. Uh, we downsize definitely 0.5 from the left uh, side. For the right side, you may use whatever uh, device guiding catheter that you, you like. And I like the idea of a passive catheter that is less harmful and more maneuverable in this uh, environment. Uh, we may sometimes, even if we have a proper commercial alignment, use the, a nice guiding catheter, we may not be able to uh, wire selectively uh, the arteries, so we have to accept sometimes to have a non-selective wiring of the uh, coronary arteries and use micro catheters or guiding catheters extension just to get access to the ostiums. And this is something that we have to become more familiar uh, with and we have to uh, consider a liberal use of guiding catheter extensions or micro uh, catheter. And then we have this uh, type of uh, anchoring balloon techniques that may be useful to advance these extensions. And uh, uh, for those who have access to that, some steerable uh, micro catheters like the Cobra or the Venture may be useful uh, to engage selectively the coronary uh, ostiums. So this was a kind of summary of the tips and tricks for coronary cannulation. Uh, let's see uh, uh, how we did uh, within the, this patient, within this anatomy, with this 25 portico device in a small anatomy for a patient requiring PCI of the left coronary artery. So Didier, while you're you're making your exchanges, maybe a few words about this uh, PCI technique uh, across a high uh, frame transcatheter head valve. So we're going to see that in a few seconds. But mainly, what are your main uh, your main tips and tricks? So the uh, the first idea is to try to. Uh... Uh, put for, to cross uh, the, the device centrally to make sure that we have a wire that gets into the left ventricle. We're going to repeat that. And this is just to make sure that we are not uh, coming from the side and entering the central part of the, um, of the portico device and then uh, through the leaflets, just to be sure that we are central. So you are, the idea is to, uh, uh, to make sure that you fall into the left ventricle with a wire and then that uh, wire is going to drag that uh, a guiding catheter and just to, uh, to make sure that you are central. And that's uh, really, uh, that's yeah. the first uh, step. If you can achieve that, it's better. Uh, idea behind more... that is just to avoid to, to cross through a strut of the heart flow portion because you can really easily do that. Exactly. And, and afterwards, it will, uh, it will be a, a physical difficulty to, to control your, your guiding capture and to go where you want to go. Exactly. So okay. now that we are uh, central, uh, I will try to, uh, with the wire, uh, now to, uh, to get access across the struts. We've selected uh, a free zero uh, EBU just uh, to match the, uh, the fact that we are working into a stand frame. And you see that if you have a proper commercial alignment, a nice simple end depth, uh, it's very easy uh, to achieve uh, uh, to achieve uh, uh, the coronary cannulation uh, to get to get access to the coronary artery. Yeah, so, so you uh, don't side your your shape by 0.5 yeah, approximately. Yeah, huh? exactly. Okay, good. So let's image uh, the lesion, and then we're gonna see if. Okay. A very tight lesion. Yeah, huh? very tight. So let's treat that lesion. And then we're gonna, at, at the end, I think it's, it will be time to, uh, to wrap up, Nico. Yeah. Treat the lesion, uh, if necessary, reassess the, um, the, the result of the level of the valve after 10 minutes of expansion, and then the closure of the vessel. So it's, uh, it's, we've seen uh, so live how to do it. 
it's time for a PCI. Uh, but it's, uh, let's come back to uh, maybe some discussion that we, uh, we didn't uh, uh, have before about the timing of PCI. Uh, when do we? When do you recommend to, to do it? Because we uh, decided, Nicolas and myself, uh, according to our experience uh, at our local art team, to do it after the procedure, given having in mind to use a portico device, opal cell design. But in general, uh, when would you recommend to do it? Before the the TAVI procedure, during the TAVI procedure, or after? What 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 does seem to be a uh, reasonable? Uh, according to your experience. So maybe, Mohamed, we could, we could uh, start with you. How would you do? Yeah, so, I mean, it was very impressive to see how easy it was to get into this left coronary, um, as you did in this case. Uh, of course, this is not always the case, but it was like, I mean, you had a lot of considerations. You aimed at a certain position. You, you aimed at alignment. You have chosen a certain device type, and all of these factors play a role, actually, also in the decision-making process whether to do it before and after. So this is one part, I think. There are actually a lot of questions from the audience. The audience is very active. And the majority of questions are actually about this point. Why did you choose in this particular case to do the PCI after and not before? So to tell you the truth, in my practice, considering this is um, a more or less um, easy lesion to tackle, Probably this, the ES was not that critical, so the patient, I think, was not decompensated because of the aortic stenosis. Probably in my practice, I would have done the PCI before, or maybe even in the same setting, just before TAV and doing TAV, so probably not staged, but in the same setting, but before valve implantation. Um, um, there are other particular patients where I personally, as we discussed briefly, would prefer the opposite. If I think the AS is the main problem, if the patient is unstable, and I think PCI will be very extensive, particularly in the setting of, for example, reduced LV function. So um, like instead of doing a protected PCI with an impella and so on through the diseased valve, sometimes if you just repair the device and then get the patient back a few weeks later, uh, then you can do the PCI at, at an, like more um, stabilized, uh, in a more stabilized setting. Um, again, these considerations should like consider the type of the device I'm implanting, the technique of implantation, um, and the ability to obtain access afterwards. So, it, so the, the patient is one thing, and the anatomy is one thing, and probably the device type is the third thing. And like by combining these three different factors, you make the decision whether you, you do the PCI at all. Sometimes you don't need it. You, you do it before or with or after the time. So very clear. And so just to, uh, to answer the audience, we decided to do it uh, during the procedure because first the patient had a normal LVEF. Uh, so the, the, the overall risk of the procedure was uh, minimal, normal renal function, because it's true that we have to consider that this is an, uh, an increased uh, uh, contrast volume for the patient. So the, the lesion was very simple. So there was the ability to do it uh, during the, the TAVI. And most importantly, the device that we uh, did select uh, enabled that. That is to say that easy coronary access. And you have, to, as you said, Mohamed, to keep this in, in mind. If you use uh, over devices with over positions, even the portico with the different position could have been uh, more challenging in uh, different patients. So it's always about integrating everything the patient, the lesion, the type of device uh, that you are, you're going to uh, to use, utilize, and I like that uh, that conclusion. So, any, uh, do you have any additional uh, comment, Mauricio, or do you fully agree with? Uh, with no, I think the main message is that at the end is still a decision tailored on the patient, depending on so many factors. That uh, I would agree also that uh, even if it is not economically attractive, that in an 88 year old lady, if you can avoid a second hospitalization for logistic and uh, social region is always good. So I fully agree with a simple lesion to do simultaneously like, like, like you did. So this is another piece of information that is uh, very important. So also the, uh, uh, the, the will of the patient, because sometimes it's difficult to, to bring back the patients to the hospital. And this is very important to, to consider. Uh, so let's see uh, what is the, uh, the final outcome for this patient. And I think uh, we will have time to answer uh, 
remaining questions from the audience, but we also tackle a lot of uh, questions and, uh, and I like it. Let's see the outcome and uh, we'll come back to you for the, the remaining questions and the wrap up. Didier, we've just uh, finished the case. You closed the femoral artery. You have under your eyes the uh, iliofemoral angiography. That is good. Uh, no uh, residual vascular complication. Maybe uh, we can just come back to uh, the final um, articrute uh, angio, uh, confirming uh, um, that our outcome that was good. Mm -hmm. huh? So depth of implantation that is controlled, not too important. Good commercial alignment, trivial leak, and uh, last information important: the uh, final result after PCI of his uh, LED diagonal lesion uh, that went well and uh, without any technical difficulty uh, in this context through the, the frame. So, Didier, if we maybe summarize the key learnings or mo most important points of, of this uh, case, I think it was the opportunity for us to review the main contemporary technique and steps. Uh, of the portico uh, uh, valve implantation, mm -hmm. focusing on the uh, cusp overlap technique in order to minimize the AV conduction disturbances, and this patient uh, doesn't have any for so far. And on the second aspect, that is a commissural alignment, mm -hmm. in order to make the, the future reaccess to coronary arteries easier. And I think it was good example here. Um, regarding the positioning of the valve and regarding the technique to reaccess this uh, this left main to perform the LED diagonal uh, uh, PCI. So I have to thank you, Didier, for this beautiful thank case. You. Thanks our team, of course, Sabine, uh, Marlene, who, who were with us. And uh, thank you for attending this webinar and uh, hope to see you soon. Bye-bye. So that was the, the final outcome and uh, reviewing that case and one of the last questions that I had from the, uh, we had from the audience about the timing of PCI and whether to do it before or after or during. There is, uh, to my, uh, from, our, from my experience, one indication for which I would systematically do it afterwards is a nostril lesion with quite uh, narrow sinuses because sometimes you put the stent before and it comes, uh, it comes that you may crush that stent with the, uh, the TAVI device. So if I have that feeling, I do it systematically, putting the TAVI device first and then doing the, the, ostiums afterward, the ostium afterwards because it's, uh, it seems to be uh, safer. So you see, we always uh, find something new <laughs> that we can, uh, we can provide. So um, uh, are there any uh, remaining questions, Mohamed, as you are the master of the uh, online <laughs> questions? Yeah, there are a lot of questions, actually. Just a, a short comment to what you just mentioned. I like this comment as well, because I can recall a case where uh, the patient was referred to us and the colleagues were thought they are doing us a favor by putting an osteal stent uh, before doing the TAVI, and the stent was actually eight millimeters in the aorta. So we had to find a way to deal with this, and it's, it was quite tricky. So it's, uh, I agree. So there are a few questions about generally about the, how to diagnose um, the possibility of obtaining coronary access before you go to the cath lab. So if a patient has a TAVI and he comes and he's in a stable condition, does a CT before coronary angiogram make sense? Um, just to understand the position of the prosthesis, whether you have commercial alignment or not, and whether you can access the coronaries. So what do you think, Maurizio and, and Didier? Well, I think it's really appealing as an idea, but if the patient comes with acute coronary syndrome, I don't think it's a good idea to bring him in CT and then to study the position of the valve. And at the end, there are no fixed rules on how to deal with this. Obviously, if it is more challenging, you may use the trick that we mentioned before, but at the moment, unfortunately, I don't see really a realistic space for, for this practice. Even if it is appealing, probably you can gain a lot of information, but... Uh, this is something which is feasible only in elective setting, for sure, not in an acute setting. I don't know what you think, but... Uh... Mm -hmm. I think it's, um, it's a very wise comment. The patient has to be uh, at the center of the equation first. Acute coronary syndrome, we don't have time to do a, a, um, a CT scan before. But something that we may do just after uh, every single TAVI procedure, if we think that the coronary cannulation is going to be a little bit tricky, is to do it 
to do it, even if we don't inject a lot of contrast through the coronary arteries, just to uh, uh, to provide some uh, indications for the the operator that is going to treat this patient in a couple of months of ye or years or about where to search, which type of catheter to utilize, and uh, uh, waiting for the vast majority of the operators to uh, learn how to uh, do this current coronary cannulation post-AV. That's something easily uh, achievable in the cat lab. After the procedure, probe the coronary arteries with a, a, a catheter. Just record that, thinking about your uh, peer who is going to treat this patient uh, in the future. Right. Any other questions from the audience? We have a couple of minutes. Yeah, if we have some time, there are also some questions about diagnosing coronary artery disease before TAVI. Whether, like in your routine practice, Didier, are you still doing a coronary angiogram in every patient that is being referred to you for TAVI, even before uh, deciding on transcatheter versus surgical treatment? or? Do you make the decision first, okay, this is a TAVI patient, and then afterwards you check the coronaries? Yeah, that's a critical uh, question, a key issue, and I'm going to answer uh, very simply. Yes, uh, we do it systematically for every single patient because it's part of the decision-making uh, between uh, surgery and TAVI because this is one of the... Uh, uh, element of the equation. If you have a very diffuse uh, coronary artery disease with a high syntax score, uh, it probably doesn't make sense to go for a TAVI and we should consider something uh, at the surgical level. Okay, so I guess, uh, Mauricio, uh, would you uh, wrap up? Because we uh, we had a very uh, dense and intense uh, discussion and uh, you, you may have many things in mind just to summarize what we said. <laughs> yes, time has been running. It's already one hour and we've been discussing so much. But at the end, I think the most important uh, elements of this session and learning point were how to, to perform a portico implantation with an optimized procedural step and setting in, a, in, a, in the modern era. So implanting high using the cusp overlapping view and how to get uh, commissural alignment combining these two elements that most likely will become a standard step uh, for, uh, for portico valves. And then we've been discussing also regarding the timing of coronary artery treatment in patients with associated aortic stenosis and uh, coronary artery disease. And at the end, we've been learning that it's still a patient-based decision tailored on the clinical and anatomical setting. And probably this will open, I think, both of the learning points will open perspective for future stu studies to, to gain knowledge and to make a recommendation on this. Thanks a lot for uh, joining. Thanks a lot for running this webinar. And I hope uh, all the, uh, the participants enjoyed and uh, got uh, some new insight in this technique. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So we enjoyed uh, it a lot. So uh, thank you to, to Abbott. And this is only the first episode. Stay tuned for the other episode of this PCR webinars uh, series. Bye-bye, guys. See you soon. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.